Hi everyone, I am so, so excited because I am speaking with author Lisa C. Again, I feel so privileged, I, you have no idea. And we're talking about her brand new book. She's got the copy of it right there. She's gonna show us this absolutely beautiful cover. Look at that, hold it up a little bit higher. Uh, the Island of Sea Women. Oh my gosh, you know, Lisa, a I, there we go. A higher. Perfect. I, there. not only did I read this book, but I listened to it because I, well, I think I listened first and then I read it actually. And it was because it was so beautiful listening to it, but then I wanted to read it because I know the names, like I was getting, you know, like I wanted to see them in print right, and, right. you know, but the person who did it was, I mean, it was such an amazing story. And I, I knew like, as soon as I saw this book, I was like, this is going to be amazing. I knew it. Like, <laughs> cause you write such great books and I was uh, blown away, blown away by this story. And to be honest, I like, I, I watched a lot of videos of you talking about this a book. Mm -hmm. And I, and then I was like, even blown away more by this story. And I think that what we love is hearing stories that aren't connected to us. Like we hear so much about the people around us and history right. around us. But when you take us to an island off the coast of Korea, and you hear their history and their culture, which you always do so beautifully because you did it in your last book. And so I'm going to let you talk about, you know, these women, these incredibly uh, amazing women. Well, so um, you're right that this takes place off an, on an island off the of South Korea called Jeju. And on this island for hundreds of years, they've had a macrofocal society. So not a matriarchy, but a society focused on women. And the women there have been free divers. They take deep breaths. They dive down about 60 feet. That's deep enough to get the bends. They stay underwater two to three minutes, harvest seafood. And so they're the breadwinners in their families, and their husbands are the ones who take care of the children, do the cooking, take care of the house. And so with this book, I wanted to write a novel of friendship. You have two best, you know, supposedly best friends for life, Young Sook and, and Mija. And kind of what happens, you know, they first they become babe, what are called baby divers, and then they're kind of working their way up, learning, and they become itinerant workers and uh, go traveling to do the work that they do. But, you know, this island and Korea just in general has so much history. And a lot of that history is just stuff we never learned, or at least I didn't learn right. in school. I, I think that when we... For example, just if you think about World War II, if you think of all the books and movies and television shows that have been set in Europe in World War II, and then you compare that to the books and movies and television shows that have been set in the Pacific Theater during World War II, it's like it's just minuscule. So, you know, I, partly how we were raised in school and what we learned in school, but partly our popular culture hasn't really tackled uh, this history at all. So I wanted to have these two best friends for life who do this extraordinary work at Tenyo, I mean, see women, uh, at, you know, and this and just, you know, it's an art that's and a profession that's about to die out. So when I was there, I interviewed women in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, most of whom are still diving. And so I just wanted to, you know, first capture this idea of friendship, this incredible world and culture that these women live in that's so unique and then also have this backdrop of the larger history of uh, Korea and um, this, you know, last, we'll call it last 80 years. Yeah. And you know, what's really sad to say is how my history of the Korean war was MASH. The TV show MASH. Well, <laughs> MASH, and I think in school, I don't know, I just felt like by the time my teachers got to it, or even the people who were writing the history yeah. books got to it, they were tired. Yeah. You know, they covered so much other stuff that, that just what we learned about the Korean War was just tiny. So you're right. I think most of what we know is from MASH, and MASH was a sitcom. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Like, if you were to ask me, what did you learn about, you know, what do you know about it? I'd be like, well, I watched MASH. Right. <laughs> so I know. Hot lips. <laughs> Hot lips. And I know what they went through, but they didn't even talk about the war that much. But oh. just being 
And I know you went there, yeah, which I was just like, wow. I mean, I looked at pictures after I read the book. I really, like, I got so involved in this story. I was looking up videos and pictures of these women because I was like, it was so intriguing to me. And that's what I love about your books. It's like, you can't just put them down and walk away. Like I spent the entire day on YouTube looking up like documentaries that were done on right. these women and, and just the island and the history of the island. And, you know, that was the most fascinating part to me was in the book was learning about what they went through with the Japanese, right. their island, you know, just like how they were like off the coast and just kind of, this is my take on it, didn't want to be involved so much, but were drawn into a lot of politics. And like, well, I think also, you know, they, they, they historically, this island was like a stepping stone, you know, right. it was out there in the Pacific by itself, mining its own <laughs> mining business. Its own you know, for a thousand years, it was its own kingdom. But, but, you know, here it is, this stepping stone. And so all these other countries and cultures used it as a stepping stone to get somewhere else. So, China used it as a stepping stone to invade Japan. Japan used it as a stepping stone to invade China. And then, of course, on December 6th and 7th to invade countries all around the Pacific in the start of uh, World War II. So, you know, we just, I, I, I think that that was so interesting, this idea of this little piece of land um, having this such a strategic importance. And yet for the people who are living there, it's not particularly strategic, it's just their home. But other people saw it as being strategic. Yeah. And, you know, still is today. Well, you know, I love the humor that you put into the dialogue with these women. You know, you can almost imagine, like, being amongst them and, you know, yeah. because they are the breadwinners. And so their views of men are so different than, like, our right. view of men, you know? Like, like, oh, they're just at home, you know, taking care of the – we're, we're, like, risking our life every single day to, you yeah. know – and then you have to give them an allowance and how do these <laughs> men spend their allowance and they're so frivolous and they don't, you know, they don't think about money and all of these. Uh, to me, that was all very funny. You know, these women in real life are very funny. They, they, they're pretty loud because they've spent their entire lives, you know, deep underwater. So their ears are pretty damaged. So they're, they're loud. They also, I don't know, I think it's because they have been facing life and death every day that they do have this real sense of humor and they love to tease. They love to tease men in particular, and then they love to banter. And so, you know, they'll have discussions like who should eat more men or women and why, <laughs> you know, and everybody has an opinion about it. Oh, yeah. The, I mean, just to see like how they dove, like with what little they had on, like, equipment what like is and I love when I watched you um give a talk and you were like timing people on their breaths because right. people don't understand how long they had to hold their breath and like nobody could do it right. in the audience like, yeah so everybody funny. they get to about a minute the most on the whole tour was a minute and 45 seconds yeah and, and that, that would be like, like one or two people every couple of days and most people were you know well under a minute that's I was, me. Yeah. I'm under a minute. <laughs> yeah, me too. And, you know, these women also would dive in really cold water, as you know. Yes. yes. <laughs> can, I, can I hold the book up again yes, just so absolutely. people can see Please this? Do. So they they wore these little cotton outfits, that just little homemade cotton. And this is the winter version with the little jacket. Um, and so this is not a lot of protection when you're diving in off the waters off of, for example, Vladivostok in winter, where the water was so cold that the only thing that kept it from freezing was the, was the amount of salt in the water. So, you know, these women not only have this lung capacity, but they, uh, for a long time, were considered to have the greatest ability of any group on Earth to withstand cold. And... Um, you know, now they wear wetsuits, so it's it's different. But but back in the old days, you know, all the way to the late 1970s, they were just wearing these little handmade cotton outfits. Yeah, and it was like, you know, you went into a lot of detail, too, about um, how they were training. Like, they trained the next a generation of girls. And I was thinking, as I'm reading this, I'm like, okay, so they're learning how to do the breath thing. And then they're learning how to sustain 
themselves in very cold water. Um, and then the woman in charge like has to keep, I, I, didn't, I didn't grasp the concept until I watched the video of how many women the woman in charge had to keep track of. Right. That, I, I was just like, oh my, like that alone, like, you know, because a lot of the story is about that woman in charge and how important her job is. And I think, you know, to get the visual on it, when I got the visual of like this just all, you know, code cover, like I couldn't grasp how many women were diving and how many right. she had to like, you know, be in charge. You just of. have the, yeah, have her peripheral, you know, like her antenna yeah. out, make sure that everybody was safe, that everybody got back to shore, that no one was injured, that no one died. It was a really big responsibility. Right? Really big responsibility. And to realize, like, the time. Like, you know, wait, that one's been under, you know, like a certain amount of time. And oh, then, right. To, you know, it That's was right. just, what an incredible, like, you know, the way they were connected, these women. Mm -hmm. So then we have these two girls that are the main characters. And, you know, so they're in, they've been together for so long and gone through all this stuff, which is just incredibly, you know, bonding as women and then get husbands and children and add all that stuff into it. And by the end, I was just crying. I was a crying mess. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I saw um, a post on Instagram today of a woman who was writing about the book and she said I cried the entire second half oh. and you know whenever I hear something like that I'm like oh I don't know is that good or is it or is it bad but you know actually as the writer I'm thrilled when I hear things like that because that means that I actually had an impact that that you felt enough about these characters that, and they felt real enough and the situation that they were in felt real enough that you can feel real empathy for them. So, of course, when I, I, I know I, I just feel badly for keeping people up all night and for making them cry, but inwardly I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going for. And, you know, the story, the story is a story about forgiveness. And, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and everybody can, you know, I, we all can relate to uh, stories about forgiveness and, and, you know, like having lifelong friends and what can you forgive and what can't you forgive and, and holding on to forget unforgiveness and what it does to you to do that, which we find out through these characters and we don't do giveaways at all. But, you know, when you were exploring that, what were you, what was your, like, what were you thinking about forgiveness? Well, a couple of things actually. Um, so first you know, you're so right when we have just a friend or maybe someone in a family that you, you know, something terrible happens. And then how do you forgive? How do you forgive when the unforgivable has happened? So that's very personal, that one on one. But then you start to escalate it out. Is it family to family, neighbor to neighbor, uh, town to town, country to country? And, it, you know, it just gets bigger and bigger. And so, you know, there are countries that have had to forgive each other within their own country, like South Africa or Rwanda or this island, much smaller, which did go through this devastating time period where uh, for over eight years, 30 to 80,000 people were killed. And, um, and then after that eight years was over, not only had people suffered so much trauma so much loss of life and also property and all, just belongings, everything. But that they, but that now after that, for fifty years, they had to keep it a secret, and and that this was really under threat of death. You know, you could be arrested, right. sent to prison, killed, and so could everyone in your family. So this was so serious, you know, and to keep it a secret like that. Well, today this island is known as internationally as the island of peace. And it's one of the reasons why I set the book when I did, because I did want to look at how they did it and, you know, what, what happens um, to individual people, you know, and this idea, sometimes I think we're, we're taught that forgiveness is an act of self-sacrifice mm -hmm. that somehow, if you know, I, okay, if I forgive, it's for the greater good of my family, of my country, but, you know, so it's not so personal, right? It's just, it's an right. act of self-sacrifice. But you could also look at forgiveness as this act that once you do it, that you're freeing yourself from that terrible moment, 
from that terrible experience, from the terrible losses. And that in doing that, you actually free yourself from be, being a prisoner of the past. And so I just, I, I knew that I had wanted to write about this, the, you know, so-called 4-3 incident. What I didn't realize was that this theme was going to be woven all the way through the book. Mm. That beginning with the very first chapter, there's, um, well, again, I mean, it's so early in the book, we don't have to worry too much about giving things away. But there is a, a, one of the young divers who is in a very bad accident, and she survives but she's very badly brain damaged and is never the same. And so how people get blamed for that, the type of guilt you feel. So that was set up right away. And I, and then, you know, a couple chapters later, something else pretty yeah. bad happens where again, the, you know, young Sook, the main character, yeah. she feels a lot of guilt, but people also kind of blame her. Right. And so how do you forgive yourself? How do others forgive you? And, um, and I, one of my favorite parts of the book is when many years later, uh, Young Sook has has come to this place where um, she has to go visit someone. I don't want to say who, mm -hmm. and she's really conflicted. Like, should I do it? Should I not do it? I, and and she goes to all these different people and asks them, "How did you forgive? You know, how did you forgive what happened to your sister? How did you with um, the Kang sisters?" And yeah. And she goes to the shaman, How, what should I do to forgive? Should I forgive? And they all tell her, you know what you need to do. But she can't do it, at least not yet. Right. And, and to me, the, the, I think one of the big lessons of this book, or what I hope people will take away from it, is that all the things that you lose when you can't forgive. And she loses so much by, by holding back her forgiveness for decades. Right. And, you know, the when you get to the act of like forgiving a, lo a lot of it or when you when you decide, I should say, when you decide to not forgive, it's like sometimes you go up against like, but am I holding on? Especially them. It was like by forgiving. Am I letting down people? Right. The people, you know, am I am I letting down? Am I being am I, you know, protecting my family? Right. And am I letting them? And then it, that's when it gets all very complicated, <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. you know, because really your heart just wants, you know, like she, your heart was like pr protecting. She was like protecting her heart. And that's how I saw it. And, and I saw, and you know, so I, my, my heart went out to her because I was like, it wasn't in a mean, like, I just want to be unforgiving. It was like oh, protecting her heart and her family and all of that came into it. And oh, the story, Lisa. Oh my gosh. It's just, I knew, you know, this is like one of my favorite stories so far this year. And I just knew it was going to be, you are an amazing writer and I love oh, your books. Yeah. And I know this isn't a giveaway because I heard you talk about it in one of your talks. So tell everybody about how you write that last sentence. Yeah. So I always write the last sentence first. I may not necessarily know what the plot is or who all the characters are, but I always write the last sentence first. And it's because I want to know where I'm going to end emotionally. And as you sort of pointed out, a lot of bad things happen in my books, you know, <laughs> generally, but in this one too. But I need to know where it's going to end. And, that, and so it doesn't give too much away, I don't think, to say that this book ends with a breath, a breath, a breath. Yeah, which for everybody, you know, is... The three, which I really like, even after the first time I was like, I went back, I'm like, that's right. They take the three breaths in order to hold their breath that long. Well, they yeah. take the three short breaths. Right. Trying to, to really get a lot of oxygen into their lungs. It's just incredible. It really is. And I encourage anyone, go watch those videos. Go watch those documentaries. There's documentaries. Yeah, and you know, you don't have to go looking all by yourself. I, if you go to my website, that's I have right, a section right. called Step Inside yes. the World of the sea women and I have several videos there I have photographs I have photographs of my trip but one of my favorite videos I don't know if this is one that you watched was done in 1957 following a little girl yes. as she's beginning her training and she's just this little skinny little thing in her little out you know little yeah outfit she's just with her friends this one shot 
they're sitting on a boat and they're also shivering, you know, just shivering, but they're learning, just learning how to control the cold and in their, in their own body. Yeah. Your website is amazing. And that's where I kind of started my journey on looking them up. Absolutely. I'd forgotten because I did it a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, your website is amazing with this. And, and I'm like, when I get done with this, I'm like, how does she, what's she going to do now? What did Lisa do when this book was over? Like, did you have a moment, like when you finished this book, did you like have like a moment of like, wow, like I just wrote this incredible story and you know. No, because as soon as you finish it, you have to go back to page one and start it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that always well, keeps it real. Right? say is, um, and a couple of people have said this to me, that they feel like this is my most mature book. Well, maybe I am more mature now. I don't know. Um, but I but I do think that there is something there about the emotional quality of this one. To me, does seem to have a sort of deeper, you know, this like emotional depth. Um, and and I do think, I mean, I can see how that would be because, of course, I am getting older. And I and I, all of us, you know, we experience right. different things. Yes. We experience sadly different types of losses that you don't have when you're 20, 30, right. usually. Um, you have a better sort of understanding maybe of relationships and emotions and sometimes those things that are, you know, not very good emotions. You know, I, sometimes when we're younger, we get very focused on love. Uh, we haven't had our hearts broken yet or not terribly broken. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so all of those things that I, I feel like, my own life experience has helped me bring a, uh, I don't want to say a new richness, but maybe a deeper richness to this novel than, than I've done before. I hope I can keep going deeper like that. Uh, are, are you writing another book right now? I, I've started to do the research. I haven't really started writing yet. Um, soon, though. Soon I'll start writing, and then I'll just be holed up in this room and, you know, tied to the computer, tied to this table and, and just working away and, and going uh, to those, those emotional places. You know, when I wrote Peony and Love, uh, this is about the 17th century women uh, writers and women writers who really held this belief that you have to cut to the bone to write. And I really, I, I understand that, you know, and I really believe that, that you have to cut to the bone and, right. And to do that isn't always easy. Um, you know, I don't wake up in the morning and think, woo, I get to kill off somebody or whatever, you know, is going to happen. But I do have to be able to willingly go to those hard and sad and dark places um, to make it feel real, you know, to make it feel like real people who are living real lives. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. In order for, uh, I can't even imagine with it. I can't wait to read your next book though. <laughs> like I, I'm like already anticipating because I know how unbelievable, like your research is so good. And so you feel like you're there and you get mm -hmm. us there. You take us to these places that we've never been to and you take, and then we feel like we have been. And I feel like I was like, I feel like it's a place I I've already been to. And I love that, but show everybody this cover one more time, because I want to show okay. everybody the colors, not just the women. I mean, the women are just, but the colors, I mean, this book is yeah. your books are get beautiful covers. And this one, well, is one thing that I love about this, and I don't know if this comes across on the screen, but these little sea plants that oh. they, but of overlay, they're all a little, meta you know, different type of metallic. Yeah. So there's a kind of glow to this when you turn it that I just love. And then they also did this paper that feels almost like velvet. Yes. And it's it's just extraordinary. I I must say I think this may be my my favorite jacket. And I've had some beautiful jackets, but just the way it feels and the way it glows, I I love it. Me too. I actually saw it in Barnes and Noble because I only got it digitally. So I'm like, I need, when uh -huh. I go to Barnes and Noble, I go visit the covers. <laughs> right. I, but what I also love about that is that the women, after you read the book, you understand that the women are holding the weapon, the, the knife, the, the tool, the special the tools, tools, you know, that they used. And that plays such a huge part in your story. And I'm just so happy that they got that on the cover. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Ugh, 
It was amazing. So everybody, <laughs> I am going to put the indie bound link so you can go support your local bookstore. I'm going to put Amazon so you can get it on your Kindle today. If you want it on your Kindle, I'm going to put Lisa's website and all her social links. So you can, you know, go on the website. You will love her website. And, uh, thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. This oh, is wonderful. I'm glad we got to do it again. Me too. And I can't wait till the next one. I'm already anticipating it. So I'll be here. Okay. So you, know where I, you know where I'll be. So <laughs> have a great night, Lisa. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.